I've previewed and hinted at all the solar shenanigans for long enough, so this time we'll actually switch it on. Plus I want to share some other bits and bobs with you afterwards. I left you in the lurch over the port side pair of 100 watt solar panels. All panel sides, save for the leading edge of the front panel, are now securely bonded to Alan's fiberglass. This is the problem section, where the boat curves away in two dimensions. I'm bonding a spacer into the corner. This is the right height so the panel isn't contorted, but I'll need to fill the gap and edge it, either with environmental seal tape or something similar, otherwise waves and wind will get involved and no one wants that. I've rewired and simplified the series connection between panels in a past episode and bedded the joins in putty. I may change this in future to reduce the bulk even further, but that would reduce the ability to plug and unplug at leisure. All I need to do is wire in the positive and negative lines up to the railings, where there are ready installed conduits and along to the stern. You've heard me grump about chunky, stiff and low strand count solar panel cables before, so as always I'm going for silicon ones with a large number of strands for the given cross section of conductor, 150 in this case. There's only one downside and I'll show you in an upcoming video. Capable of delivering 200 watts if you're in Utah or the Sahara Desert and would indicate Alan has got lost somewhat, these panels need a cable to carry a dozen amps at absolute maximum, but more commonly between 5 and 10. There's a good 25% headroom on this cable, but it's not chunky so it's easy to route. It's only travelling 5 or 6 metres, and I calculate this won't cause much voltage drop, a few percentage points at most, but I will double check. This is the old sprinkler system exit port. I sealed it up and added the top screw hatch yonks ago, before Alan's YouTube days. I've added a bracket just above, and eventually I'm to add a hinged protective cover over the whole assembly. It's the main point of access for power, and camera signals and so on, so it seems sensible. You're all staring at that ugly monstrosity on the front. It's a multi-entry cable gland I originally bolted on, but it's become so drilled, reworked and mangled that I've signed its death warrant. Naturally, this is a job for the cutting wheel, as it cuts the bolts at the same time as slicing through the sealant and putty. A mucky side effect though, the heat appeared to break down the rubber gasket into an adhesive. It's sticky in jet black and doesn't harden, so I had to go around with a rag and some gentle solvent. A flat wheel cleaned the steel surface of all the grot, and now I'm going to bond into place a neat fiberglass panel. New glands can pass through this in due course, if I can find ones with extra long threads. The only supplier I can find in Germany won't ship here. Oh I do love trawling Google for hours in vain hope of extra long thread cable glands. What I can do though is feed through the first side entry gland for these port side solar panels. The stainless steel this box is made from is exceptionally hard, god knows why. I've had to use a step up of four drill bits of increasing sizes, each of them brand new and with plenty of cutting compound. Finally though, a hole was made, and so the gland and solar wires can pop through and seal. I don't want continuous cables running through the boat, because it's a nightmare when you want to change configurations or generally fiddle around with things. So at points like this, I want a junction. The inside of the box will be double weather sealed, so the contents don't need a serious IP rating. These micro junction boxes are perfect, less than a quid each, and I can label them. Within, I've gone for lever junctions. There'll be space for maybe half a dozen of them in there, with a variety of connections once I'm ready to switch everything back on. You can also just about make out the embedded bolt I'm to use to collect together all and any 24 volt deck circuits on the negative side. A single larger cable can then be sent down into the boat towards the battery bank terminal. Which conveniently brings me to head inside. I'm not going to go through the cable routing, as I'll quickly summarise it once totally finished. I've also heard that repetitive cable routing stories can cause havoc with middle of video audience retention statistics. So, time to mount another blue thing into the grey thing. The main electrics panel, the one you've seen tons of before, is busy already and I've decided to mount the solar, wind and battery management gubbins a few feet away. I won't need regular access, I hope. You've seen the episode of unmistakably riveting solar charge controller unboxing, so I won't go over those again. There's one for each panel array on either side of Alan. Also in here will be space for this battery balancer, a lot more of that in an upcoming episode, plus a wind charge controller and a handful of accessories. 
Most can be bolted straight to the robust plastic enclosure, but one has such tiny mounting holes that I've opted for cable ties. I'm going to mount the box vertically on a side hinge so it can be folded out of the way, and for that it needs a rigid brace, otherwise a few kilos of mounted contents will start to contort the plastic. Never one to be accused of over-engineering, naturally I've sought the assistance of my large pile of not yet installed ballast steel. With the ends primed and dip coated, we don't want rust stains in future years after all, and some carefully located and then relocated bolts, when I realised I clashed with some of the internals of the enclosure's moulding, it all came together as planned. I can now mount it to a hinge at leisure, and what joyous leisure that shall be. At the top I'm fitting a tiny extraction fan, as charge controllers can get hot, and a couple of holes at the bottom so cooler air can be drawn in. Usefully, one of the controllers has a direct 12 volt output, so all I needed was a switch, and the fan can be powered easily from within the box itself. I could have sworn I shot a film clip of the completed top, but you'll have to trust me that I also fitted a fine stainless steel mesh above the fan on top, so that large debris can't fall in and damage the fan or mess up anything inside the box. As I said, I'm not going through all the mounting and cable routing here, as I'd like to still have a few subscribers left at the end of this, but you'll have to again take my word for it that electricity can flow from the solar panels through the deck box and down inside Allen. Before wiring anything up, I thought it best to check the open circuit voltage for the two panels. 35 volts in dim shade isn't bad, so green light for the next step. Forced to wait for the charge controllers to get yet another firmware update, the tension within Allen grew. What would happen? I wired everything in the right order, battery first and then the photovoltaic circuit. Bingo. Blue bulk charge light went on. The sunlight levels up top were still poor, but we had liftoff. Between 3 and 8 watts, so about 2 or 3% of the perfect theoretical output of the system. I'm going to take another controller up top later to double check there's no major losses going on within the system, but I won't bother you again with the solar stuff, aside from a scintillating PWM versus MPPT video until Alan is fully solarized. Apart from this question, the cables need to cross a foot or two of deck, albeit not the main standing area, but somewhere boots will inevitably end up. I have an idea in mind, but any ideas? The cables need to be accessible and protected by something strong and UV and cold resistant. On to yet more ingenious Allen activities. I usually do these smaller jobs once I've reached saturation from all day and all evening jobs on the key projects I'm working on. To make best use of the limited space in the driving console zone, I want to use some of the vertical foam insulated areas. It's squishy, and so can't be used for mounting anything of any serious weight. So I sliced out a couple of rectangles, and I'm using some spare off-cut wood, which isn't a bad insulator itself, to fill that gap and provide a mounting anchor. Plenty of solid grab adhesive beds these blocks in nicely. I've made the panel from, again an off-cut, of DIY carbon fibre sheet, gloss on the front and textured on the back to help with the bond. I'm using a basic strength sealant, as I don't want it impossible to remove in a hypothetical future where we're all government mandated to remove our boat mounting panels. I only have one gadget to affix at the moment, but doesn't this iPad or nav screen mount look smart? I may use this groundbreaking technique elsewhere too. Also, some closure on the hatch handles. They need insulating so they don't give people cold burns in seriously low outside temperatures. You'll recall that I tried some rubber dip coating, wonderfully available in a coordinated orange, but although it seems robust and suitably high friction to be grabbed onto, it was very fiddly and wouldn't have been possible for some of the other hatches, where gravity would make the dips undippable. So I've relented, taken the advice of a commenter from amongst your eminent ranks, and so saw some good quality heat shrink that won't go brittle or crack. Simple as that really, and oddly satisfying to do. In other news, I've purchased a box. This is nearly my last offering for today, but yes, I realised on the London River Thames trip, go and watch that by the way, that normal toolboxes aren't good at sea. This one can have the essentials kept organised and safe and not clinking around noisily against each other. It can also be bolted to a fixed surface. I've lined the bottoms with white tape, easily replaced and repaired, and also some pinch and pluck foam. This white stuff is stiffer and less likely to get damp compared to the grey foam you get in camera cases and the like. And now the finale. Some of you will have noticed, and rejoiced, in that I have made a new channel on the tube. 
I realized that I couldn't mix up topics and styles of videos too much on one channel without incurring the wrath of your more fickle ilk, so this was needed. It's called Arguably, and it's more about thoughts and ideas than this original's channel, where there's evidently plenty of thinking and ideas, but you get my point. I'm going to tackle different issues, sometimes solo and sometimes in conversation with others. There will be overlap with my Arctic work, but I'll also explore some far-reaching concepts too. What I'd appreciate from you would be to head over there and appraise the first video. Every channel starts from scratch, so a kickstart from everyone here in views and subscriptions would make a serious difference to me. You can either use the link on my channels tab or just search YouTube for arguably Alex Hibbert. Don't worry, my time investment in this channel won't be impacted. I'll just work harder, eh? On that note, I have stuff to do. Bye.